the dead dive. What, oh, Captain Hollister? Everybody's dead dive. What, oh, Top Hunter? What, oh, Selby? Not Chen. He's dead, Dave. Everybody is dead. Everybody is dead, Dave. Hello there, and welcome back to Everybody's Dead, Dave, the Red Dwarf Review podcast featuring myself, Adam Martin, and as always, my co-host, myself, Phil Hawkins. That do be him. We're back once again. We're on series eight of Red Dwarf, the last series of the BBC era. And uh, we're on episode six, uh, which is Pete part one. So we've got another multi-parter, Phil. We had a three-parter to start mm. with. So I think this is the most multi-part as we've had in a Red Dwarf series so far. I think it is, yeah. And it's really weird because it's one of the two series that is actually eight episodes a series. A lot of yeah. the series are six episodes. And yet because of these multi-parters, it almost feels like it's a shorter series, but it's not. It's a, one of the longer ones. I get what you mean, because uh, there's technically less. There's not eight stories. It's like six or whatever, but yeah. more episodes. Yeah, it's an interesting one. But um, I must admit, going into this, because, you know, I'll read the synopsis in a sec, but I was like, Pete, that's a very nondescript, very vague type. That could mean a vast variety of things. And yeah, we'll see what we discuss when we go into it. But the synopsis for Pete is uh, as follows. Rimmer and Lister are not having a good time. They're frequently in and out of the captain's office for various offensives, which annoy Hollister more and more until he keeps threatening them to put them in the hole. But just, um, who is Birdman and what is Pete? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Mm. So there you go. So kicking things off, I- I've got to say, and I know I've said this before, but the way this episode starts after the title sequence is we get a panning shot of Red Dwarf with the original theme music the slow the slow version of the theme and i it always send, gives me a little shiver when i hear that it's just so good um and i, I wish they used it more but yeah um, and i i'm gonna come out in defense of a lot of people talk about the cgi in this series but actually mm. every time i've seen the ship the red dwarf ship even when it's in cgi i think it looks good fair enough fair enough I, I'm, it's I'm definitely staking not the, my my flag in the take. ground there so that's my hot take <laughs> The yeah. CGI Red Dwarf looks fine. <laughs> yeah, it's not appalling. Like I've definitely seen a lot worse CGI from this same time period, frankly, from stuff with a lot bigger budget as well. There's there's worse CGI in the show as well. I mean, like oh, yeah. midgets and stuff like that. But the but the Red Dwarf itself is yeah. it, it's I think it looks quite good. I just find it odd though how and I think we said this before as well, but it happened in this episode where later on you have a panning shot of the ship and it's definitely the model. That they've used, right? Okay. Or, or to me, it looked like the mo- it looked very different from the. So either the CGI just got really better really quickly. Well, maybe or I am. Maybe I am mistaking out. the CGI for a model work. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm... Yeah, we'll need to do like a compact, like a video compiling all like the CG moments and see see what we think. Yeah. But um, as the synopsis says, Lister and Rimmer are having to face the captain, um, to answer for a prank. Now, when they started this, because obviously this concerns um. Uh, Mac- Ackerman. Oh, Ackerman, that's it. it, concerns him. I thought we were running directly on from last week in Crikey TV, which for those who might have missed it or haven't caught up yet, they uh, list has fooled into basically defacing Ackerman's quarters. And I know they, they cleaned it all up, but do you know what I mean? I thought like yeah. they'd been found out and then it's nothing to do with that, it turns out. Yeah, it's almost a missed opportunity there, isn't there, to like have a bit of connective tissue between the episodes. Yeah, I just, yeah, I was like, oh, we're connecting. And then they just mentioned something completely. Di- it is fun, though, seeing Rimmer and Ista like, at, like, I guess you call it, like jovial schoolboys, you know, like when they're being told off and they're like, yeah, but it, it was pretty funny, wasn't it? Or, like, Yeah, and you, I, what I really like about these scenes when they're called up to the captain is you get a start to get a sense that they're friends mm, again, mm, which, yeah. you know, because it's the old Rimmer. It's, it's yeah. Rimmer like he was in series one where they weren't friends, really. It's nice to see that again. Absolutely. And like it, it hones in as well that there's so many elements where they're different and they disagree or whatever, but then there are those few things that they can share a laugh over or, or something like that. And we get more Mr. Ackerman, which I think we said last week is only a good thing because he's he's great. Was it Graham McTavish, I believe? Yeah. Is Ackerman? I really enjoy it. Even though it, it's only this little snippet, he just, he nails that sort of, I don't know what you'd say, like camp yet cruel sort of 
security guard sort of yeah i can't going. remember which one of these scenes it's in because i didn't write it down but i've just remembered the bit where he's talking about how because they're they're like he's why would you do this to mr ackerman and they're like oh yeah but he's just he's a smeghead and yeah. he's like he, i and he's very offended by that i am not sir <laughs> i'm extremely nice lovely in fact warm caring but most of all nice Hence my nickname, Nicey Ackerman. Which strangely rolls off the tongue, I think. Nicey Ackerman, I quite yeah. like that. Yeah. And we, we get a little flashback to when, um, I guess, the gang first met Ackerman and how just how nice he was uh, as he proceeds to beat up Cat for, for speaking without permission. And uh, Yeah, that was a weird flashback because it, it flashed back and the start of it, I'm sure, was actually a scene that we had in that I first thought episode. This, yeah, yeah. But then it kind of dovetailed into something different happening than what happened we like there's a new yeah. bit but that didn't happen in the actual episode so we like co- like red dwarf and continuity red dwarf continuity strikes Let's, again yeah. So, yeah but no it was really we- I, I thought like the, the gag was funny but i mean you know what's coming was i think it was a little too long phil <laughs> i don't know if you thought the same but but i got the gag was funny like you know cat being beaten up for yes you know by this guy who's meant to be nice it is funny but when it just kept going and going and i was like you know i i don't know i just it fell a bit flat for me i guess after a while what did you reckon yeah yeah i can see that it was i did like it um where initially when cat was like i'm just trying i'm just trying saying what such a nice guy you are and then he yeah you know, gets hit again and... gets hit again yeah. yeah there it is regular listeners you've had your adam says it's too long scene or hopefully it's the only one i think it might be to memory um but hollister suggests that to uh even things out the uh the our gang, or the cons, as they're labelled, have a basketball game with the guards. And uh, Lister and Rimmer are a bit hesitant towards this because they, well, they know they'll get beaten up. And sure enough, we cut to a basketball game where exactly that happens. They're getting absolutely hammered. They're losing, I think it's like 48 to 3 at first when we see it. Yeah, um, they, they're they fouling. The guards are fouling all over the place, but yeah. obviously not getting called up on it. And uh, It's like yeah. those sci-fi games where it's like the, the rules are there's no rules. Like it's just beat each other up, um, but in the you know in the halftime it's not going their way. But they uh, they do have a plan, uh, whereas uh, Lister was able to enlist the services of, of I love how they give him a name Bob the Scutter, yeah, um, to provide him Bob. with a a certain a certain mixture that goes in their drink, which uh, basically makes anyone who drinks it um, very very aroused for a long period of time without their control. Seven hours. Seven hours. <laughs> Seven a hours. Very long time, and um, the effects kick in. And sure enough, any fellas out there? I'm I'm, sh- I'm sure you're aware. If you know if, if things are going on, it's very hard to move fast. Shall we say in a sports game? If if you don't want to expose yourself, um, and it allows <laughs> the gang to win. And it, yeah. it, it was funny. I did like it. Um, yes. Did you think the game scene was? Like the right length, like the whole. Uh, it, it yeah, to... yeah, it wasn't yeah. too bad. Um, and the humor in it, I I did find it funny, but yeah. it did seem to be a part of a recurring trend for series six for them to go to sort of like sexual humor, which they did do a K. I think we mentioned this last episode. They did do a K. It's not like they never did it before, but it mm. it seems to be a lot this series. That they seem to be yes. going back to this well of having. You know, the humor being based around something sexual quite a lot. <laughs> it's yeah. like, have they run out of other ideas? It's not that yeah. they're not always funny because this I think this was funny, but it, it just seems to be that they're going back to to the same idea a lot of the time. Yeah, it's like we're leaping a lot to the cruel, hu- uh, not the cruel, sorry, the crude humor and not yeah. much else. So, uh, yeah, it's an odd one. I did notice that last week's episode was co-written uh, by uh, someone who isn't uh, Grant or Naylor, uh, by a guy called Paul Alexander, I think his okay. name is. And he also, just looking, yeah, Paul Alexander, he also co-writes uh, next week's episode, Pete Part 2. So ah. it'll be interesting. Obviously, I'm not saying he was like this, the crucial factor into why Crikey TV was the way it was. And obviously, he's got no writing credit on this episode. Um, but you know what I mean? It's just interesting to wonder, like, did a new writer... Come in it because there's there's not been many new writers, has there? Aside from uh, 
uh, Grant and Naylor. Over no, the years. didn't um, didn't Robert Llewellyn write one? He, co-write one. I, I think he did. Yeah, we've mm. had some new write, but for the vast majority, it's it's either Grant or Naylor who who tackle it. So yeah, and Grant hasn't been involved for the last couple of series. No discrepancies. eh? happens to the best of us. Um, but with this uh, new uh, uh, mixture. Uh, the cons win their game uh, by quite a lot. They celebrate, but Lister and Rimmer have to return to face the captain, who of course is not happy. And what's the what's the line? He goes, he goes seven hours. It's like, do you know how long that is? <laughs> that um, was a very good I, it, thank impersonation you, yeah. of Captain Hollister. I like that. Um, yeah, he because he got he drank some of it too. So <laughs> mm, yes, he did. And uh, do you know what? I don't know what it was in that whole game scene. Maybe it's the red cap. I don't know. He kind of reminded me a bit of Donald Trump, and I don't even know oh, why. Yeah, I no. know. I'm not going any further than that, but I don't know. I just got, I just got a vibe. I was like, this just, this just strikes me as something that Donald Trump would do. But um, yeah, the, and the captain basically uh, treats them to. This is where he says that he's on. They're on potato peeling duty, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think so. But he's, you know, he keeps uh, any more discrepancies, and they'll be going in the hole, which we don't know anything about at this mm. point, but. Potato peeling is their fate, and they head back to the cell. And um, we have a little scene where a bunk scene, which I know we've said we tend to enjoy them, just for the dynamic of Lister and Rimmer, very evocative of those <coughs> of those early scenes, but the, uh, early seasons, sorry. But this scene, obviously, you have the thing with like the supper and the gags about that, and a lot. Then we have this scene about like rumors and hearsay, you know, about like uh, using an airplane toilet only when it's in the air or other oh, things yeah, like that. Yeah. And it sort of, I don't know, like it's, it didn't go on, I'm not going to say it went on too long, um, but you know how last week in Crikey TV we sort of said, we feel like we're going down one path and then there's something else that just feels like it's there and it doesn't, yeah. parts of this scene, not all of it, but parts of it to me felt a bit like that. A lot of the material I liked, I, I enjoyed it, but I was kind of like, where are we what what's happening i guess i felt a little bit the same way throughout because and they kept on getting called back to the captain for different things and i was kind of like where's the what's what's the plot gonna happen and yeah 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 partly that's because it's a two-parter so they had more time to do the build-up than they normally would to get yes. to the main plot which is kind of the other guys finding what they find on the ship but so yeah so these scenes kind of felt like i was wondering okay where what's gonna happen next where's yeah. when's the central plot of the story gonna get going yeah. was um, it a good bit of padding uh some of it was okay like i like the bit when we do get uh scutter bob he, oh yes scutter you know bob, bringing yeah. bringing list to his curry when oh, yes. uh rimmer is already tucked into his horrible uh prison supply Supplied meal. Talking of uh, the prison supplied meal, I'd like this is a, such a small thing, but I like the mm. fact that the guard, the extra they've got as the guard that comes in, is, yeah. has been the same in multiple episodes. Yes, yeah, I noticed that. Nice bit of it's, for once continuity in uh, Red Dwarf. <laughs> I know, and good for that extra because extras often TV crews aren't bothered about what extra. You know, it's like uh, they've got tons of them. So yeah, I agree. Again, a nice example of Red Dwarf taking the tiniest part of continuity and really sticking to it, but then just taking the bigger concepts and being like, "Now nah, we're just gonna, we're just gonna do our own thing." Yeah. Um, but on Scutter Bob. Um, Rimmer clocks on, and I must admit, you know when he gets the curry out the roof, the the way Chris Barry's face was, like he had that realisation, I, I thought he was going to say, wait, we could have gotten out this whole time, like through that hatch in the roof, do you know what I mean? I yeah. Thought, I thought that's what he was going to say, but... But they already, caught... do, they, they already did get out last week. <laughs> I suppose so, yeah, and they just, oh yeah, didn't we say like, there's no, <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any like, real... I don't know what you call it. Any real like guarding here? No, it's, just... it's a terrible prison that you can escape from really easily. Just if 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 you're a fan of strict continuity, I don't think Red Dwarf is is the show for you necessarily because it just it'll wind you up. But uh, Rimmer's actual realization is: hang on, if Scutter Bob can get him a curry and do, get all these things for him, maybe he can grab. Uh... Well, what does Rimmer suggest at first? It's not. Then a sharper knife, isn't it? Because their, their potato peel is all going to be dull. 
But then Lister comes up with the idea of well, the better, programmable, yeah, the programmable virus, yeah, yeah, which he knew, knew about for from his time previously. And I, li- I did like the fact that they referenced back to like, oh yeah, if the if the nanobots also rebuilt that and it is in the same place because the ship has changed, you know, it has. The, yeah, the configuration of the ship, so it might be might not be there. But absolutely, uh, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> so we, I like the next bit, but possibly it went on too long. Um, oh, the, is this the contacting the Morse Bob code? Or? Contacting Bob's missus, Madge. Mid Bob's <laughs> missus. Oh, yeah, Madge. <laughs> of course it's Bob and Madge. Like, what else would it be? And, yeah, uh, it's I, doing, like, Morse code on the pipes. And it's it's funny to a degree. And, it, it's, you know, there's, like, he's banging out, like, something angrily. And then there's, like, one bang back. One bang back, and, yeah. Uh, and stuff. And then it turns out, wrong number. Wrong number. I don't think the wrong number gag deserved the applause that it got from the studio audience, quite frankly. Yeah, I mean, I didn't mind the wrong number gag. I didn't think it was a bad gag. Oh, yeah, yeah, the gag was fine. It, but... it wasn't, yeah, but I know what you mean. The studio audience kind of seemed to think that was, like, the best thing ever. Well, I thought I'd missed a trick. I was like, wait, was that, what, have I missed, do you know what I mean? Because like, they were all, like, whooping and clapping, and I was like, I, I think we all just watched the same thing, but... That's comedy for you, isn't it? But yeah, so, so you think you think the Morse code gag went on a, a, a tiny bit too long? Yeah, I do. Uh, yeah. Do do not. Is this one time oh, when God, I think that... it went on too long and you didn't? Um, I must admit, my like thinking back, I didn't. My gut wasn't saying, "Oh, that was too long." I think I just, I I don't think the payoff. I was. I think I was more not miffed, but more surprised at the reaction from the audience than I was. Because, as I say, the gag, I was like, oh, yeah, well, that's, you know, it's a funny yeah. gag. But I was like, oh, it just made me feel like I'd missed out on something, which I don't think I have. I think it is as plain as it is. But, yeah, no, I don't think it was too long. Well, that's a rare moment, isn't it? Look at that. Yeah. Reverse. Um, and then uh, we cut to one of the, the gang are going on one of their canary missions on the on the Manny Celeste, which I thought was a nice little... I thought I thought that was a call to the Mary Celeste, the famous ship that uh, when they found it, it was lost at sea. And when they found it still floating above the water, all the crew had it was abandoned, completely yeah. abandoned. And they never found the crew. Yeah, and... that's because the Daleks uh, <laughs> oh, chased them off. <laughs> yeah, including one of them falling <laughs> off it itself. Yeah. That's a story. That's a story for another day. But um, yeah, I thought it was a nice reference because it seems like they're going around this aban- abandoned ship as well. So I was like, that's that's cute. Yeah, that's nice and it's just Crichton, and Chrissy and Cat here. But it's, it's kind of like I like the way they kind of separated out the two stories. So you've yeah. got two little groups doing their own thing. You got Rimmer and Lister doing their thing with the potatoes and getting in trouble with Captain. Then you got the other three following this plot line. Yeah, handle much better than Crichton TV tried to do it last week. That's for yes. sure. Um, but I, I've got to say, in the, at the start of the scene, there was like an instrumental track playing, and I, it could just be my ears and things sounding, but it sounded like an instrumental version of the song "Crazy" by Seal. I don't know if you remember that. No. Oh well, I. It's probably just my. I, I listen to like lots of music in my spare time, and just well, I heard it, and I was like, wait, like that sounds eerily familiar and i think crazy came out sort of like mid to late 90s so it's sort of around that time but that was just a little anyone in the comment if you know for a fact that is the song please do let me know or if they just made something that sounds very similar but um they find some people on on this ship some other canaries in fact but they're absolutely completely still um and they they realize they find what's it called the is it just the t- they call it the time wand i think don't yeah they? colloquial name i don't think that's its well it might be its actual name but i I don't think we get any other options so time wand is what we get um and this one can i believe Crichton says digitize time and then it can be replayed in however manner you want or something like that i don't think we should think too too in depth (laughs) about the logic of this time wand yeah i mean when he said it digitize time in my head i just went what what (laughs) what 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 does that even mean like that but yeah you're right we we, sh- we shouldn't think about it too hard one thing i did enjoy about this scene though is the actors playing the other canaries you know how they did their like stop start thing yeah i think they did that really well cuz they were stopping like on a like sudden and yeah and it wasn't like they just did split screen and fr- froze the 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 video of them mm. or the film of them they actually the actors like froze yeah. Mid sentence, yeah. slowed down, sped up, did like 
And and yeah, you could tell it was oh, them of course. doing it. Like, yeah. But it still I thought it was quite effective. I think the commitment to it sold it. Had it not been as in a way overdone as it was, it, it would have been a bit limp. But that the main guy doing it, I thought sold it brilliantly, like with his facial expressions and his, using his body. I, I really liked it. Um this this device can also make people younger, as we discover, as he turn uh, Crichton turns uh, Kachansky and Cat into kids. Uh, who made me chuckle? I've got to admit, as child actors go, they weren't they weren't too bad. Interesting thing about um, another Doctor Who reference here: the actress oh. that played, or the the little uh, the little actor that played mm. um, little little Chrissy, yeah. uh, she was the um, the daughter in the Doctor, the Widow, and the Wardrobe. Oh, in Doctor Who. Oh, okay. Yeah, is that, a, is that actor? No way. Yeah. So that oh, God, nice that's like at least there. 10, 12 years apart. Well, so yeah. So I looked up. So that may have got me thinking about like, well, how old was she in that? Because she was playing a child in that. And this yeah. is like 12 years earlier and she's still a child. So she was, according to IMDb, born in 1992. So she would have been eight. No, set. No, like six, six, set, seven, 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 seven ish yeah. when when recording this, which means that 12 years later, she would have been about 19. She wasn't playing a 19-year-old. She was playing younger no. than she was um, yeah. in The Doctor, The Widow, and The Wardrobe. But yeah, nice little... Oh, well, good for her. Thing good there. For She's her. still acting. Good for... Uh, that's great. And I mean, The Doctor, and The Widow, and The Wardrobe, over 10 years old now, which is slight, slightly scary. Yeah. Um, but there yeah. you go. I was um, talking about the time wand as well. Another the feature of it speeding up and slowing down. And, the, and when Crichton's talking about the slow canaries... Mm. I liked the line about the little chef waitress. So you mean they're moving just incredibly slowly? About the same speed as the average little chef waitress. <laughs> That's why they don't appear to be actually doing anything. <laughs> Again, another <laughs> culture rep. Because little chef doesn't exist anymore, does it? Does it not? Or not, not, in, this, not in this not. country, I don't it, think. I, I think it, no, maybe it doesn't. But it was fairly recently that it still did, I think. Like, I yeah. remember there being a little chef. When I moved to the town I live in now, which I've lived in, okay, yeah, for nine years. But yeah. uh, I remember seeing one on like the side of a motorway, but whether or not that was abandoned or occupied is, I think I've, I've only been in a little chef once when I was very young, and I can't remember whether I liked it or not. But we never really went to it. We didn't really have many in our area. So no. did, did you go to them? Often, I mean, I've or? been to them not often. I've been to them on occasion. Usually, we'd stop at the bigger service stations if we're going on a car yeah. journey or anything. But the I've been to the occasional Little Chef, and I don't have particularly fond memories oh, of the no. food. I can't oh, remember what the service was like, but the food mm, was never a bit that dire. Great. Oh dear, maybe maybe it's for the best that they've 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 gone, but um. But they they deduce, like, sort of like Lister and Rimmer did with uh, using Bob the Scutter, that with the time wand, they could manipulate time to basically cut down their sentence so they could make it so two years have passed and then, then they're free to go. So that's there. And, and like I said, it's a good segmentation of every character gets to do something. Like I saying, so now you've got these guys with the time wand and then Lister and Rimmer with their programmable virus uh to which we see them with their mountains of i wrote in my notes the lads face their mountains of cgi potatoes <laughs> yes. or superimposed potato which oh it, it did get a chuckle out of me i've got to admit i was like this is just too adorable to to it, not like you know the style of the superimposing of the potatoes in the background and them on the background and the size difference mm. and all of that that they'd done very much felt like season three when they're like in the like I, it made me think of that episode where Rimmer is teaching Crichton to use Starbug, and he's doing the test, and oh, yeah. they're they're standing just outside of Starbug in the cargo bay, and yes. that so it kind of feels like the the technology hasn't improved in those years. What te- like nine, oh, ten years, nine, or ten it years since, it, yeah. since that series, but or maybe the budget's finally starting to run out. Yeah, <laughs> we're getting to yeah, we're getting to desperate measures, but it did make me giggle. Um, they unleash the virus, which which seems to work. The potatoes are peeling themselves. It's quite a success. Until Rimmer notices that it's also eating his clothes and his hair and everything. Uh, it just doesn't stop. And uh, it happens to both of them. And I thought the, I mean, it didn't look obvious to me, but if they were, the bald caps they were wearing, I thought looked very convincing. Yeah. 
I yeah. yeah. Because some, you know, Doesn't sometimes you watch things, and exactly, sometimes you watch things and you go, "Up, oh, there's the line." But no, with both of them, I thought I, you could tell me they legitimately shaved their heads, and I'd have, I'd have probably believed you. But um, I found that quite fun. Do you have anything else to add for this scene? Uh, not, not while they're there, but when they they get to the captain's office and they're being marched to the captain's office, sort of naked, holding, concealing their dignity. Uh, yeah. in their hands and that Never was thought i'd see that on this show <laughs> that was quite funny um completely hairless bodies because uh, the virus has eaten it all away yeah. and, and another fun interaction with captain hollister who i do find really funny in most of his I, like i appearances. loved when they when they enter and he just goes well like with the smuggest look on his face I, I, he's brilliant like he's, he's been brilliant this whole episode really but of course um he well he no he doesn't sentence them to the hole at first does he he says if i ever see you in here again you're going in the hole yeah to which rimmer shakes his hand uh, which then begins the whole thing anew because so he transfers of, the virus to him exactly and out of that frustration he sends them to the hole um but before we get to the hole we we do cut back to the others uh kachansky cat and Crichton. And the, the main thing I wrote about this scene is there's a line Kachansky has about there's a boob job joke. They're discussing like how they're going to use the time wand, you know, to, mm. to do it and how they'll they'll hide it in a safe place and then they'll use it when the time's right or whatever. Um, yeah. And then just she mentions, oh, I was going to see something about a boob job. Oh, just thinking, you know, when she gets she said, when I get older, you know, and I just I don't know for. I think like we said last week for Crikey TV, it just seems very out of character for Kachansky. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't, and it doesn't strike me as something she'd be bothered about or again, preoccupied about. It's there is the series going back to that kind of that well of crude jokes again, which yeah. again is fine in like little doses, but I think possibly they're doing it a bit too much. Yeah, it and it just the whole it just seemed very left field for me. Do you know what I mean? It just felt yeah. very left field but um this is uh, isn't this the scene as well where cat gets his head put in the oven or something oh yes because he um yes he accidentally knocks the bully guy prisoner Mm. really big guy who is another eastenders actor uh oh really for a few years can't remember who he played in that but he was in eastenders for a few years and he yeah he so he gets basically his head slammed into the food processing unit and hot bovril poured over his head which would have definitely scorched him more than this show is allowed to show you. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but then they sit at the table. They get a little. They get a little bit of revenge. Crichton uses the time one to turn it, the guy's uh, food back into a living animal. Um, but Cat gives the game away. But just before this guy is about to pounce on him, he's frozen. And the the effect of him being frozen in midair, I thought, was pretty decent for the for the late nineties. Like yeah. the effect they used looked all right. And then they just freeze everyone. Because why not? <laughs> That's the only answer. Um, and then I think we do cut back to the hole, do we? Or yeah, we, it... we we meet Birdman, don't we? Hmm. Mm. The Welsh Birdman. The Welsh Birdman. Yeah. I did like. I really liked his accent. I love a Welsh accent. Oh, beautiful accent, mate. One of the one of the best around. Welsh accent, that's for sure. Not because I'm half Welsh or anything, but yeah, one of a beautiful accent. And um, he introduces us to his his bird called. Pete. So the bird is that is the title. And I must admit, I was like, okay. I wondered how it was gonna carry on to episode two of the or part two, but we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, because we were quite far into the episode by this point, and we're only now yeah. being introduced to Pete. That's what I mean. Like you, you hear a title like that, and it's so with it being one word, I was like, this could literally be anything. Do you know what I mean? It could be a person, it could be a, a code, it could be anything. So yeah, quite late to introduce it. I, I did love the gag about him being nine. Yeah. And he says, oh, he's nine in bird years, which means, which is, what, like nine in regular years. So that means he's, and Rimmer's just like, nine. <laughs> that typical Rimmer. <laughs> but they're not in the hole for long, because uh, Bob the Scutter is here to save them. Good old like, Bob. Must have, he, he must have found them around the wrong number thing. He just must know where they are, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, he's always probably on the lookout. They've become good friends. I wonder if the Scutter, because like, the Scutters were kind of on their side from the beginning because they in the well that was actually that was technically an AR. I was gonna say they mm, were trying to break I out. Suppose with them, so. But they yeah. and they donned the mop heads. But I just wonder if they're like 
if they've still got the memories from the old ship or something. Uh, where Ooh, they were alone that'd be interesting. Them. I don't yeah. know. I or maybe ju- or maybe Lister's just very good at bonding with yeah bonding maybe with scutters maybe which I could believe absolutely I did love the fact that when Bobby's rescuing them he's humming the Great Escape theme tune yes yeah <laughs> nice little touch always out the air then um, but when Bob breaks them out they see everyone in their path is completely frozen in place and again the actors I think are doing a great job because like you said they're not just been superimposed or anything the actors are there and they're not frozen in necessarily some of them the easiest of positions to like stay, do you know what I mean? Stay frozen in like a lot of, it takes a lot of effort, but they find the others. They're having a celebratory dinner. They're all dressed in their finery, which I found quite funny that they've gone to the effort to, you know, rather than actually breaking out or like attempting to, well, I guess they had to wait for the others, but do you know what I mean? They've gone to the effort to like get dressed up and like have this dinner. I think, I think they would have been so fed up of having to wear that prison attire, especially cat. Will, yes. have been, will have been like eager to get back to his wardrobe and Absolutely. put on some snazzy attire again. But, uh, and, he, and he does pull it off. It's oh, nice yeah. to see Cat in his snazzy attire. Yeah, it's kind of good to see them back in their own clothes like like we've seen them for the last several years and things. So. Absolutely. So Lister and Rimmer and Birdman with Pete join them. Um, but in all the excitement of being of breaking out, um, unfortunately, uh, Pete the Bird has died. He's no. gone all stiff and cold, and poor Birdman doesn't really, doesn't really know. And because I think uh, this is what I liked. You know, last week we said Crikey TV had a lot of moments that dis- that we felt didn't really fit with Lister as a character in any way. This I really like because he immediately says to them, you know, he's he he had that bird a long time. It was the thing. You know, it's a it's Lister's better nature showing mm. the compassionate side, and I like moments like that. I probably wouldn't like it if it was like used every single week but you know i mean in moments like this i think it really shines through so i quite like that um but of course as you said this is a part one of two so to simply use the time one to restore that'd be too easy that'd be too much of an easy fix so instead somehow it's not really explained but somehow Crichton manages to not just revive pete but reverse his evolutionary state um yeah. citing that the bird came from ancestors of and their ancestors are dinosaurs. Mm. So now Pete is a gigantic dinosaur. Yeah. Um, and now before we just get into like the cliffhanger, the I was trying to work it out, like, did this was do you, was this all CGI to you, or do you think there was a blend of like practical or Oh, and... see I I actually thought it was probably um model work, but hmm. I don't know. There were, I couldn't. This was one of those moments where I was struggling to. Some shots, like you know, when his foot appears, mm. I thought that could be like practical because I think they did a similar thing with the original Jurassic Park, like bits that were real. Yeah. Um, but then I think certain shots of like either him in full or like the head to me looked a bit more CGI. Yeah, but, maybe. Then yeah, or maybe it's a blend of the two. I'm not sure yeah. actually. Sure. I thought he looked all right for 1999. I thought the realization was was good. Um, but yeah, so Pete is now a dinosaur, and the others are like, "What the hell do we do?" Uh, poor Birdman. He stands in Pete's way, gets uh, sneezed on uh, quite a lot. Yeah, it's quite grim, and then eaten. Uh, but he goes out with a joke. Uh, he offers him some seeds. Bless him. Uh, to which he takes that as a no. So but, uh, Birdman sadly is gone, which I was a bit gutted about because I quite like Birdman. And he just sort of gets disposed of. As for the others, uh, they run. Uh, cat, As the famous cat saying, what is it? Like, we're all gonna die. Or whatever yeah. he says. Um, and then it just says to be continued. And and yeah, that is it. That is Pete part one. What do you think of this like cliffhanger moment? Do you feel it's a strong cliffhanger? Uh, yeah, I, I do actually, because it's a really unexpected, out of nowhere kind of change that if you hadn't seen this episode before, like who would have guessed that the bird would turn into a dinosaur and then eat somebody and then run after them? And honestly, I mean, I haven't seen this series in oh maybe fifteen years, so oh, wow. I. I can't remember what happens next, to be honest. So it's going to be a surprise for me too. Or it'll be a, oh yeah, it'll be a, something that triggers me remembering. Yeah. But at the moment, I haven't got a clue what happens next. Uh, the only thing I think 
Did they did they maybe show part of this cliffhanger in the like title sequence? Well, I remember you mentioning the dinosaur when we were in the when we were talking was it, about the first episode. Was it the full thing or was it the shot of the foot? I can't remember mm. actually. Um, but I'll I remember have to take you note when we watch next the dinosaur week. and yeah. going, "Oh, I wonder what that's going to be about." I mean, regardless of that, like you say, it's completely une- like how unexpected that the yeah. le- that AP is was the bird, and then that this bird becomes a dinosaur. But it all sets it up well for Pete Part Two, which we will cover next week. But before we round off, it's time to do our regular features here. So the first being our favorite character. So Phil, who stole it for you this time? I'm gonna give it to Welsh Birdman. Welsh um, Birdman. I, I I quite like him. He's fun. He's got a lovely welsh accent he's a he little does. bit kooky he's clearly been yes. in that hole too long <laughs> yes yeah just a little too long <laughs> and yeah it's a shame we we got such a fleeting um experience yes. of him but we had him and then he was no longer there r.i.p welsh bird man r.i.p welsh bird man uh well for mine i'm gonna give it to captain hollister uh we already sort of said it but just every scene he had in that he just stole it for me in in the past episodes, I've kind of been a bit mixed. I think in some of like the jokes or how he's been portrayed or whatever. But I think he just he shone this time. I think he hit all the notes perfect. So yeah, Captain Hollister for me. And what about your funniest moment? My funniest moment. See, this is difficult because I one other note I've written about this episode and I um is that it kind of feels more a similar way to sort of series six in a way and series seven mm. where they kind of went more heavy on the sci-fi concept and it felt less well series seven really where there is less less it was more of a drama less of a comedy i mean there was what i mean there is a lot of funny stuff in there still but it i don't know there wasn't yeah. anything that made me really laugh out loud i guess i would give it to maybe Maybe the maybe the little chef gag. The little chef gag. Ah, oh, nice. Yeah. No, yeah, I like that. Uh, mine. It's Mr. Ackerman in okay, the office. Yeah. I just, I, I like seeing him. I want, I want more of him. And you know, we've only got two episodes of this series to go before the long hiatus, before Back to Earth. And I mean, you might know, but obviously, I'll have to. Find... I, I really, really hope that this series isn't the last we see of Ackerman. Even if it's played by a different actor, I just want to see Ackerman again. So, but yeah, that little scene in the office, not so much the flashback, but him in the office, nicey Ackerman and all that. I yeah, that was great. That was a good one. Definitely. And what about your scutter rating out of 10? How many scutters are you giving this one? I'm going to give it um, six and, and a half. Out of Ooh, 10 a bit more than Cryty TV, then. Yeah, yeah, definitely <laughs> more than Cryty TV. Um, and they, they, yeah, there's some good stuff. Uh, it just didn't make me laugh out loud particularly much. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. That's fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, what about you? Fair enough. How many scutters? Um, how many bobs the scutters? How many bob the scutter? Bob and um, matches. Oh, bob and matches. Ever so slightly higher. Uh, a seven out of ten for me. Um. Thankfully, a breath of fresh air after Crikey TV in many ways. There is, like we said, there's still a lot of that like sexual or crass humour, which I wish they'd tone. Not saying it doesn't have to be there overall, but like you said, I think they just they need to tone it down a little bit. Like it's it's getting a bit it's getting a bit much now. Um, but yeah, lots of strong stuff. Mr. Ackerman, as I said, Captain Hollister, Welsh Birdman, uh, some of the gags with the leads as well, uh, the, the way that the two groups of people like their stories were told i think more coherently compared to last week and as any good two-parter should i am excited to see how this resolves you know mm-hmm. cliffhanger should make you feel like oh i can't wait to see it rather than make you go all oh, right okay well next week's next week no but yeah a seven a seven for me solid seven but yeah excellent there you go that is pete part one we will be back next time for pete part two the penultimate episode of series eight to see how this goes in the meantime um Phil, where can these people who are listening find you on the internet? You can find me on my YouTube channel, which is just Philip Hawkins, Philip with one L, where I talk about all sorts of geeky pop culture, like Doctor Who, the MCU, Star Trek, anything that takes my fancy, mostly Doctor Who, to be honest. Uh, but this podcast goes up there, and it's a great place to it go does. and leave comments about what, what you think of the episodes as 
well because you can't do that on normal podcasting apps. To, you know, can't comment on each episode individually. So no. you can on YouTube. Go and, so go check that out and let us know what you think of the episode there. Um, and also, uh, I'll plug this while we're uh, while we're in this section. Also, go to the YouTube thing and write. You can leave us a question because we're going to be doing a Q and A yes. after we wrap up series eight. You can yes, ask us yes. our thoughts on any specific aspect of Red Dwarf. You know, our theory, any theories we've got. You can ask us something that's completely unrelated to Red Dwarf if you really want to. <laughs> you can ask us about the podcast. You can ask us about anything you want. So um, yeah. do that as well. No, we love questions. My favorite ever question I've ever had in doing YouTube was, do you own a washing machine? Hmm. And I loved it because it was just so, it was just so honest. And I was yeah. like, that's such a very mundane question, but. I admire that. And, I mean, and at the time, now, I didn't own a washing I, I machine. I now need to know, do you own a washing machine? At the time, I didn't because I was in, like, studenty okay. dig, so it was a communal thing. So I didn't own a washing no. machine. But I, I do now, thankfully, own a washing machine. <laughs> My, <laughs> so, you I, know. I own a washing machine that is currently broken, so... Uh, oh, no. <laughs> currently oh, shipping off all my washing to my in-laws almost every oh. other day to get it washed grateful for the in-laws in yeah. that respect then <laughs> and um for myself it's adam martin with a y on youtube and adam martin amtv on twitter you can check those out see the kind of stuff i make also we have a twitter account for this podcast at all dead dave pod you can go and follow us there for updates on the podcast uh trivia about red dwarf few memes as well we love a good memes just all sorts really so go and check that out there also i mean you can leave us questions on that twitter account as well um there is a tweet about that so youtube or twitter is great we also have a merch store which you can uh, check out if you look at the link in the description you can buy t-shirts which you can't see it but phil is modeling one right now uh also mugs um and various other good assortments that you can get with our little cartoon characters on there and our logo so please do check that out and let us know what you thought of the pod in the comments on youtube as phil said we love to hear your feedback and yeah that's pete part one so we'll see you next time for pete part two goodbye see you later